Well, good morning. It's great to be here. Uh, my name's Chris, if we've not met before, and uh, I was with you uh, in September, I believe, which seems like a long, a long time ago, and I spoke to you out of John chapter two, and um, look how far you've come. We're, we're in chapter 13, and I'm gonna be speaking out of that, uh, those verses today, but I wanted just to encourage you, I guess, before we go any further. Being here in September was, was great, and um, you know, so much is going on in the church and blah, 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 all this stuff. And I wanted just to encourage you because it, I don't know, it feels really different being here. How, how many months ago was that? Five, less, three, four, five, whatever, a few months. It feels, it feels really different being here a few months on. It, it, feels, um, it feels like there's a, like a, a galvanizing of, of the body, right? It feels like there's a togetherness here. Not that, it, not that you weren't before, but it feels like there's a greater togetherness, like a unity that exists here. And I would also encourage you that there seems to be a, also a greater passion for the Lord amongst you, like a fire of, of God here. And I wanted to bless you with that encouragement and maybe later we will pray for that over you and over your community because what you carry is really significant. And uh, I wanted to encourage you that you're also changing. You know, it's, it's a privilege for me to, to be here a few months ago and to come back. And I can see with outside eyes, I can see and say, you're a different community to the one I saw three months ago. So praise God for that. Um, it's been a strange week in our house um, this, this week because I, I, was, I was booked in to come speak on this passage, I think before Christmas. And um, Helen and my wife, who's, uh, doing some training for ordination at the moment, is also writing an essay at the moment on the same passage. So I've unashamedly stolen all of her, <laughs> all of her best bits. And if you, if you would prefer a deeper theological conversation about this, this passage, you can go and speak to her after, after, after the service. Um, I, I wonder if any of you in the room would admit to, 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 to like loving a bit of drama. Anyone, anyone will be willing to admit you just quite enjoy the drama. You, you love it. Not, I wouldn't go as far as like gossip because gossip's not, not a good thing, but like you just love a bit of drama. Um, we've got two, two children and uh, <clears throat> they're completely different in the most wonderful way. Rafi, my youngest, loves the drama. She's eight, eight and a half. She, she loves the drama. And I remember a few months ago and I was getting ready and I don't know if for those of you who have kids, like the pre getting out of the door for school routine is like sometimes, uh, it's, a whirl, it's a whirlwind. Um, and I remember um, a few months ago, we were getting ready, the family were getting ready to get out of the house to go to school. And you know what it's like, all the stuff's going on, we gotta get through the bathroom, teeth get done, shoes on, all that kind of stuff. I was on the later end of the getting ready spectrum. And I remember um, I was, I think, getting changed in the bedroom, I can't remember what happened, but then I just, I just heard this voice crying out from another room. It was Rafi, and she just shouted, I'm so sad and angry. <laughs> I'm so sad and angry. I, I bless you if you've got children that are like that. I'm so sad and angry. And Jessica, my eldest child, walks into the room, and I'm getting ready. I'm like, okay, I'm not gonna deal with this now. I said, Jessica, what's happened? Rafi seems to be so sad and angry. What, what happened? And she's like, oh, she just lost a spelling book. <laughs> And I was like, that sounds about right. That sounds about right. Rafi loves the drama. Um, you know, you get those moments in, in the Bible that are just like full of drama. There are these, these particular moments, scriptures, passages that are just full, packed with drama. I, I think of like Mark chapter four and five where there's just so much going on in such a short space of time. John chapter 13 is like full of drama. There's so much going on. We've got like spiritual warfare. We've got misunderstanding. We've got love, betrayal, denial. We've got the foot washing, which happens as a part of all of that. There's so much going on. And so hopefully you'll forgive me for not tackling all of it. Um, but we will focus particularly on some, some particular things. So what, what is our focus for today? Well, our focus today is costly love. That's the title that I was given for this morning, costly love. 
That's our focus. And the premise that we're gonna work with this morning, and hopefully we'll work together on this, the premise we're gonna work with this morning is this, that often, oftentimes, for many of us, the costliest expression of our love, the thing that we often find hardest, is our expression of love towards Jesus. That's often the thing that we find hardest. It's often the most costly expression of love in our lives is, is the expression of love towards Jesus. And yet, as we'll work out and go through together, that, that love, his love, is the thing that allows us to live life in the way that we were designed to live it. Without it, we can't do it. And so for many of us, actually what we find is that we spend a lot of our time running around like crazy, doing our best to love our friends, love our family, love our enemies, love our partners, spouses, kids, blah, 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 work colleagues. We, we're just running around like crazy trying to love them all. And often what we do is we forget our first love. We forget that that costly expression of love, sometimes the, the most costly expression is towards him first because the order of priorities in God's kingdom is clearly laid out and very wonderfully simply by Jesus in Matthew 22. The greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Later on, he says strength as well and love your neighbor as yourself. I'm a big advocate for keeping things simple. Huge advocate for that. And so that costly expression of love in our lives, firstly, towards Jesus it propels us to be able to live life in the way that we were called to live it, okay? And that's the premise that we're working with today. So you've got a Bible, let's open it up. We're gonna be in John chapter 13. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read verses uh, one, one to 17 and then uh, a little bit onwards as well. So John chapter 13. Okay. <clears throat> It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. <clears throat> the evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you are going to wash my feet, are you? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. <clears throat> For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus then goes on to um, predict um, the betrayal of Judas, and then we're gonna pick up at verse 31. <clears throat> when he was gone, that's Judas, he disappears out into the night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and he will glorify him at once. That's one of those like confusing Jesus moments. He was like, okay. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me and just as I told the Jews, so I can tell you now. Where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, you must love one another. 
By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Simon Peter asked him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus replied, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Then Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. A lot going on in those moments with Jesus. I wanna focus on a few things and I wanna use some of Peter's interactions with Jesus to help frame some of our thoughts today on what it is to have costly love or to receive costly love or to give costly love. And one of the things that I've noticed quite quickly when rereading this passage again, one of the things I found really interesting is that when we get to, to verse five and it mentions that Jesus is getting ready to do the foot washing and it says that he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. What I found really interesting was that clearly that for a whole bunch of the disciples, and we don't know how many, they were really happy with this. They, were, they seemed to be fine with the fact that Jesus was washing their feet. For a whole bunch of them, this, this clearly felt okay, which is interesting because for Peter, It clearly didn't. I find that interesting for a whole load of reasons, but one of the main reasons that I find that interesting is because what this moment does is that it exposes in Peter a perimeter in which Jesus existed. It exposes a perimeter, right? So for a whole load of these disciples and friends of of Jesus, this moment was sort of fine, we, we assume. Jesus washed their feet and dried them. The the activity had happened, and when he comes to Peter, Peter says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus says, and in my head, what I imagine happening here is Jesus gets to Peter and he tries to wash his feet, and Peter then says, hold on a minute, you're not gonna wash my feet, are you? And then Jesus sort of goes back and he says, you do not realize what I'm doing now, but you will understand, and he tries again, and then Peter's like, no, (laughs) <laughs> you shall never wash my feet. What an interesting statement. You shall never wash my feet. What it exposes is a perimeter, is a boundary line, or as Tim beautifully put it earlier, a lid, a ceiling, a box, a container, whatever you want to say. It's a perimeter with which Jesus existed in Peter's life. So Jesus was X amount of things in the life of Peter. He was the guy who did miracles. He helped him to walk on water. He did all the stuff. But he's not the guy who's gonna wash my feet. And he says, no, Jesus, you shall never. Now, I wonder in this room this morning, I wonder how many different versions of Jesus exist in the room this morning based on, on our lifestyle, based on our preference, based on the perimeters that we place around life, based on all kinds, I wonder how many different you shall nevers exist in the room this morning, eh? I wonder how many of us have a, no, Jesus, you shall never. I'm almost certain I've got a load load of them. Jesus, you can be this, but you can't be this. Now we've, Tim beautifully demonstrated already, we've just sung about it, and I'm hoping we're gonna come back to that later on. All my love, all my love, all my love, you can have it all, all my heart and all my soul and all I own, you can have it all. Isn't it true that actually what Jesus has always been after is everything. He's always been after everything. That's part of the reason that it's costly to follow him and to love him because he asks you for everything. Now, the challenge that we find often is that we tend to, as human beings in our culture, in our world now, is that we reduce everything 
into the perimeter that we create. So, so it looks like everything because we just make it everything to us in our little perimeter. But in terms of the grand scheme of things, his kingdom and his world, it's actually not everything. <laughs> it's just the version of Jesus that we made and we're kind of happy with and safe with and comfortable with. But when he gets to our dirty feet and he gets to wash it and we say, no, you shall never wash my feet. We're exposed within the boundary lines that we've created. And one of the things that I sense, I know that God's doing it in my life, in our, in our lives over there. Uh, one of the things that I feel like he's doing on the earth right now is he's exposing the boundary lines. He's exposing the areas with which we say, Jesus, no, never. Or where I'm willing to do this thing, but not that thing, because he's ultimately been always after everything. It's supposed to be costly. Now, of course, the beautiful thing about the way Jesus works and his kingdom works is the exchange is far outweighed in our favor, isn't it? You know, we, it, it feels costly and it feels hard and it feels difficult to let go of all the stuff and give him everything and God, have all, all my insecurities, all my, all my stuff that I own, whatever. It feels difficult and it feels hard, but we have to understand that the exchange far outweighs in our favor because we get him in return. We get him. And so Peter says, no, you shall never. And then Jesus answers, well, unless I wash you, verse eight, you have no part with me. Some translations will say no part in me. Unless, I, unless you let me do this, you, you, we, you can't be a part of me. Now, isn't, that's an amazing statement to make because Jesus is literally saying, this is not gonna work unless you let me do this thing. <laughs> you know, like, I just need to wash your feet. And of course, it's, it's more than the washing of the feet, isn't it? It's more than just that, that moment because it's about dealing with the exposure. It's about dealing with the perimeter and breaking Jesus out of the perimeter, getting the lid off and allowing God to actually be God in your life. Allowing Jesus to be the fullest version of Jesus, who he actually is in your life and surrendering. We've talked about that this morning already, surrendering to what he wants to do in you. Unless I wash you, you can have no part in me. And then Peter goes, have we got any like, people who live on the extremes? Any extremes kind of people? So we got Peter who goes like, no, Jesus, you shall never. And then he goes, okay, fine, everything. <laughs> well, don't not just my feet, wash my hands, wash my head. And Jesus is like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. You know, we were, never, we were never designed to live on the extremes for very long. You know, you, you see that, don't you, in, in like advent, people who do crazy adventures. You're not supposed to live in extremities for too long. People often find themselves in trouble when they're both practically and physically, but also emotionally on extremities for too long. Peter here perfectly demonstrates it. He's like, no, never, yes, everything. And Jesus is like, hold on. And he says this. He says, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and then he says, and you are clean, Peter, though not every one of you. And he's talking about Judas there. Now, it's a slightly strange statement that Jesus is making here. I want to just quickly unpack pack this because the whole foot washing scenario has probably more than two, but definitely for me, two symbolic kind of gestures, moments, things, two symbols here. We've obviously got Jesus, the servant leader. He's, he's breaking down power lines and he's breaking down all that stuff and he's presenting himself, king, leader, teacher, Lord, as the servant leader, and he's demonstrating that to his followers. Absolutely, that's, the, that's one symbol. But this other one here is really significant, and it's, we also often forget it in the, in the way that the foot washing works in this moment. This, the second one actually comes before, um, <laughs> yeah, it comes here. Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. 
what Jesus is saying, and he'll say later on, you'll see it in a couple of chapters time in John 15, he says to his friends, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you, is what he says a few moments later in John 15. He's referring back to this moment. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you, because what he says here is that those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet, but you are already clean. You need to only wash your feet. What he's saying is that, friend, Peter, you've, you've been with me for ages. We have a special relationship already. We're, you're you're going to be fine for eternity now. You're, you're good, right? You've had a bath. Your whole body is clean. It's only your feet that need a wash. Now, obviously, in those days, feet needed washing a lot. You know, probably know all of that. They used to walk around sandals, barefoot, walking in all sorts of stuff. What that symbolizes is our need for the ongoing day-to-day cleansing work of God and Jesus in our lives. That's what that symbolizes. He's like, people, what does he say? Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Peter, you've had a bath because you've been with me the whole time. Like, in terms of salvation, everything else, you're fine, but you've picked up a load of stuff along the way which is our experience, isn't it, for lots of us. We, we, we love Jesus, we're saved, we're gonna spend eternity with him, fantastic, praise God. But sometimes we forget him and we just pick up a load of stuff along the way. And Jesus is like, he's reminding us here in this moment with the foot washing, he's like, you just, every day, you just pick some stuff up. We need to deal with that. It's, it's an every moment thing, this following, this costly thing. I need to wash your feet because what it symbolizes is the ongoing day-to-day work. Helena put it much better than that when she said it's actually, it's actually about us coming to Jesus and allowing him in our vulnerability and weakness, it's, it's us receiving from him in our vulnerability and our weakness. And so that's the other really important symbol here with foot washing. It's, a, it's positioning ourselves as followers of, of Jesus to consistently and constantly be in a receiving posture so that he can cleanse us from the ongoing stuff that we pick up day to day, moment by moment, because that's what he wants to do. Praise God, he wants to do it. And it's like a, a miracle. <laughs> that I could, I could just continually just pick up a load of rubbish in my life and he would be like, hey, so let's, let's sort it out. Amazing. So, breaking out of the perimeter is really important. It's hard and costly, but the exchange is far in our favor. The ongoing cleansing of the work of Jesus in our lives is really important. And positioning and posturing ourselves for that ongoing cleansing day to day is really, really important. Obviously, the other symbol of the foot washing is, as I've already said, is how Jesus positions himself as the servant in this moment. And there's a context thing here, which is often in churches, We find the idea of foot washing really difficult, um, partly because of our vulnerability and our weakness, um, which is a good thing, but partly because it's also just not really a part of our culture and our context, as it was in this moment. So foot washing would have been much more normal, but it would have been the servant's job to do it, which is interesting because I think Peter, on, on the receiving end from a servant, would have been fine, probably, wouldn't he? Because it just, it not only does it expose the perimeter which Jesus existed in, it exposes his mindset towards power dynamics and authority. Because Jesus can be, as Jesus says, teacher and Lord, but he can't be servant to Peter. Now the other guys clearly are sort of okay with this, (laughs) but for Peter it's difficult. And so that exposes again for us sometimes how we see Jesus, where we put him, in what context we place him in. We're fine for him to be king, 
We're fine for him to be teacher. We're fine for him to be Lord, but not servant. So I wonder for you, like, if we embrace the fullness of who Jesus is, what are the challenging bits of who he is that you just kind of put on the back burner? And as a consequence, what are you missing out on in your relationship with Jesus? What are you, what are you missing out on because that bit of him is just too tricky, too challenging? And so when we get to the bit, the second bit that we read, what Jesus says to his friends is he says, I'm giving you a new command, okay? I'm giving you a new command. Verse 34, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. A new command. Now, when it says a new command, it literally means a brand new command. It's the same new that you get in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. It's the same word, new. And someone once expressed this to me as it's like, it's like a brand, literally like a prototype, brand, completely brand new. It's not like a, a restoration of the old. It's like completely brand new. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You're brand new. Same here. Jesus says, a new command I give you, which means it's a brand new command. When Jesus says, I give you a new command, we should kind of prick up our ears. Really, really important. Love one another, he says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So in classic Jesus fashion, what he does is he demonstrates something really significant in the foot washing and the servanthood, and then he explains it to his friends now. A new command I give you, love one another. But to love one another is not, it's not any old way. It's not within the confines of our capability or our parameter or our boundary line. It's really specific. Jesus says, as I have loved you. So if we're gonna be able to run around like crazy and love all those different people, friends, family, spouses, blah, 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 friend, work colleagues, if we're gonna be able to do that in the way that Jesus has prescribed it here, as I have loved you, we have to receive his love fully and first. Fully and first. And that's what I would love us to pray about. One of the things I'd love us to pray about in a minute. A new command I give you. Oftentimes, loving, loving Jesus is really costly. It should be. The challenge is that we have, in my opinion, and I'm dealing with this on my own level in my own life right now, the trouble is, is that we have reduced that cost into our, the safety of our boundary lines. And oftentimes we don't then fully embrace the call towards love in the way that Jesus really meant it. Now it's interesting as well, and I'll finish with this, but it's interesting as well that this moment is with Jesus' closest friends. Isn't it true that sometimes the people closest to us are the hardest ones to love? Sometimes. And Jesus says, love, as I have loved you, love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. And I know that you probably know this and you've talked about this before, but the way that you love each other really matters. Because as people look on at the bride of Christ in this city, the way that it loves one another really, really, really matters. And so I wanna bless you with the, I don't know, the, the encouragement in the way that you love one another 
but the, the way that you love the people closest to you and that you embrace the cost of breaking out of your boundary line. I believe that's a call for, well, for all of us, but for you as a church. Don't contain or redefine Jesus' call to everything within the boundary lines of your safety. That's not what he meant. Love us to pray together, if that's okay. Kat, can we grab you up again? I'd love that. Um, <clears throat> There's so much I would love to just to pray for, for this community, for each of you. Um, I guess I wanna start in a few different places. I wanna, I wanna just start primarily in, in the, the way that we may have contained Jesus in our lives, the way we may have drawn a boundary line around who he is and that desire maybe that you have as you sit there to break free. I also wanna pray particularly for just that outpouring of, of the love of God and, and your knowledge of it. Now, when the Bible talks about knowing something, it doesn't just mean knowing it in your head. It actually is an experiential knowledge. It's I know because I know it because I've experienced it. And I wanna pray for an outpouring of the love of God for us today because it's the only way that we're gonna be able to live in the way that we're called to live. So I want, could, we, could we stand if you're willing and you're able and just, just to position ourselves to receive from, from the Lord in whatever way he, he would... Um, he would want to move this morning. And just for yourself, be, be praying for yourself now in this particular moment and be asking, asking God for a, a, a deeper revelation of his love, a, a greater knowledge of his love. Not that you would just know that he loves you in your head, but you would experience the love of God in your life. Just be praying that for yourself now in this moment. Jesus, thank you that you sent your spirit to lead us into all truth, to teach us all things, to help us. We pray that by your spirit now, would you come, would you pour out the knowledge of your love over your children? Pour out the knowledge of your love over your children. That's it. And what we're gonna do, we're just gonna, just gonna wait here for a little while, okay? If that's new to you or it's slightly uncomfortable, please just feel at home. If you need to sit down, absolutely do it. If you wanna lie on the floor, do that. Just feel completely comfortable in whatever. But, but let's make this a receiving moment, an opportunity. Holy Spirit, would you pour out the knowledge of your love to us this morning?
this tends to work really differently for all of us. For some of us, it will be very kind of peaceful and we'll just stand there in that, in that knowledge this morning. For some of us, it might be like a physical thing that you might, you might feel it, sense it, that's fine. For some of you, it might be nothing at all in this moment. It's all good, you know, it's all good. Just encourage you to embrace whatever it is that God is doing with you this morning, in this moment. And if you're going with that idea of the, of the, the pouring out of love and that's really um, happening for you in this moment, just please stay in that. I just wanna pray for one more group of people before um, we worship a bit together as well. And that's just for any of us who have put that boundary around who Jesus is. And that we've reduced Jesus into the safety of our boundary lines. And Father, we pray this morning that for, for whomever that might be true, that you would do whatever you would like to do to help us move forward this morning. That we would invite the fullness of Jesus into our hearts and our lives this morning, the fullness. And that we would say yes to the cost, whatever it costs us, whatever it costs. And so we're back to surrender again and let's settle in that place of surrender towards everything I'm going to ask I'm going to ask Kat just to sing and for us to worship together to that those words again all my love all my love all my love you can have it all all my heart and all my soul and all I own you can have it all so I I pray for this community and for each member this morning that we would surrender and give it to you. All of our love, all of our heart, all of our soul, everything we own, we give it to you in Jesus' name. Okay, let's worship together just for a little while.